you. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. This is such a great conference, and I really feel kind of uh, like pretty inspired by this conference. But I don't know how much I could add to this because my focus is very like a limited kind of focus. I'll show you like what we have been doing in the two uh, medical centers in the Rohingya camps since 2017, October 9. So, <coughs> I'm by profession I'm a physician scientist. So I'll divide my talk into three small divisions. One is like how we ended up there, what we have been doing, and what is the disease burden or the physical disease burden status of the Rohingya refugees in the camps, and what we are planning to do and what can be done. Some solutions or invitation of questions. So when I say we, we means like, though I'm working at an uh, academic institution, we have a uh, not-for-profit organization, which we developed, we founded actually in 2011-12. Uh, that's called Health and Education for All. Is it my camera? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Health and Education for All. And then, uh, that we started when I was working in Boston. <laughs> so when I was working in Boston, so that time we founded this, and uh, the target was mostly to work for the garment factory workers in Bangladesh, because it's mostly, uh, that's how we, uh, we have some faculty members from uh, Boston and Providence, and that, that's how we found it. And what was our main strength? We were doing work since 2013 for the uh, ready-made garment factory workers, healthcare. We developed the electronic medical record system, I'll show you briefly, which is helping us tremendously in the camps. So from there, we, 2013 to 2016, 17, we have been doing a lot of garment factory workers, rickshaw pullers, and all those. We covered uh, last year actually we got Grand Challenges Canada funding for garment factory workers uh, work, and we covered almost so far 25,000 garment factory workers. This is the medical team in Bangladesh, and then th this is I already talked about the garment factory workers and rickshaw pullers, and this is the electronic medical system we have. So since this is not PowerPoint, I cannot show you the uh, sequence how it works, but you, you can see that there is an electronic medical record system. You can have a, it on a server, a laptop, and then you have the tab connected. In the next picture, you can see here that if a patient comes here, there, then the next one is station one, height and weight, then the station two is blood pressure, station three is blood glucose and hemoglobin, four is physician, then you can have these tabs uh, recording all those. So those are like interconnected tabs, and then uh, I'll small laptop can serve. So you can go anywhere. Going to camps, you can go village, you can go uh, in the jungle. But if you have that, you can work. You don't need extra internet or anything. But at that point, we are needing actually, we required electricity. But later, electricity. right, but uh, like a, then we solved that problem in the Rohingya camps. Because when this 2017, uh, this uh, crisis or what is the definition we decided on that? <laughs> so <laughs> so, so the, yeah, this happened. So that time, the 2017, August 25th, it started. And then I thought, since we have the capability of doing it, we are doing it in the garbage factory, why not there? So the challenges were, how can we go there and do something without electricity, without internet? So I'll show you how we solve that. So this is a brief, uh, I, I, I am sure that I don't need to go over this. Everybody is an expert in this room on this. I'll just tell you that one thing that I always refer is a quote from some other person, that Rohingya did not go to Burma, Burma came to me. So that we need to keep in mind. So correcting history is not solving the problem, that I know. But <laughs> just to know that actually they were independent until 1784, they were Arakan Kingdom, and 1432, 1784, they were a thriving kingdom, like really, really thriving. And at one point, they occupied the whole Chittagong for 100 years. So anyway, so then 1784, Burma came, <coughs> then British came 1824, and then the 1982 uh, Citizenship Act, which is stripped of their citizenship. So actually, the Citizenship Acts talked about anyone came before 1824. They cannot prove. So 1824 is actually uh, the landmark for the Myanmar government. So anyway, so it happened, and then, these are the camps. You can see the on the left side, those are the yellow marks. Those are the camps. Like Kutupalong is the largest camp. Second one is Balukhali, and there are 14 major camps, and there are many small camps. And the, the right side is the aerial picture. These are pictures from Newsweek. 
this is the one when I and uh, uh, Dr. Jane Carter, who is an ex-president uh, of the Tuberculosis Union International Organization, she and I went there. She's a faculty officer at Brown. So this is the picture she took. Then these are the camps you can, uh, as I mentioned, this is the picture. That right side, you can see the deforestation and all those the Bangladeshi people, we talked about a lot about the mm -hmm. deforestation. So this is the picture of deforestation. And there's Kutupalu, this is the extension area, this is Balukhani. So we have one medical center in Kutupalu, one in Balukhani, the two largest uh, camps there. So when we started on October 9th, 2017, that was just six weeks after, they were still coming. So that time, this uh, statistics is from that time, that the 750,000 refugees came by that time, 680 and then later a few more. So then women and children, you can see the ratio there. They are like, in 1982, my title of the talk is Rohingya, a people without a country and healthcare. Mm -hmm. So since 1982, they don't have any healthcare, they don't have anything. So they're, they're even beyond, they're they below the radar system. Because before I, I opened these two centers there, I went to uh, Mexico for a uh, conference, and then uh, we, we found someone from Myanmar, UNICEF chief in Myanmar. And we went to him and talked, uh, or can you tell us some data about the, like, uh, their disease pattern, vaccination? And they said, no, they don't exist. So they, were, they, they didn't exist at that point. So, and then you can see the, the health crisis, because there were major disasters after they came. Mm -hmm. They were not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And then five decades of without vaccination. So when they came, they had a lot of polio, measles, all those crises. And WHO quickly actually uh, started with the government. And Bangladesh government and the UN organizations did a fabulous job of preventing, I think, so far maybe four, five, six epidemics. Can you think of a place? Because I come from, I live in Boston, so I give my favorite example everywhere. That, that's one of the groups, cities with a developed healthcare. Boston's population is 500,000. Think of, in four weeks, another 500,000 people entering Boston without any vaccination. Uh -huh. What will happen? Mm -hmm. So that was prevented there. So so Bangladesh, uh, the public health system was very developed. The, the health parameters we're talking about that they developed, that actually helped mm -hmm. in your organization. But they failed one thing, the diphtheria. Mm -hmm. I asked the government and the WHO, they said, somehow they they're like thought, like why they didn't do the EPI? Because there are six vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't give that, they didn't think of it. And that was the crisis. Then somehow they avoided that, but it's still 43 deaths. I came back uh, from there three weeks ago. There are still uh, uh, cases ongoing. It's like sporadic cases they're having now. And when they came, you can see that uh, there were 150,000 children, 64,000 pregnant women, 7,000 children without parents. Mm -hmm. And then 52% women were reported to be sexually assaulted. 32,000 births in Maine, 2008. So that's another thing, like nine months after the assault, there are 32,000 words in the camp. And there are many women actually came out. And there is a Newsweek article, I think, that they were talking about this. These are the, uh, like, they were raped victims. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many things happened at that point. So I think, and one of my uh, friend, who is a UMass uh, Boston's colleague, uh, he is an anthropology professor. He went there and actually interviewed 23 families, documented what happened to those families. Every single person killed in their family, in their village. And someone took a picture of a military army uh, shooting them, the, the tag of that person. So he submitted all those reports to get a French organization. And that went to United Nations later. That happened in 2018. And that report is actually online on UMass Boston. If you go, you can find it. That report is in English. So that would be good for the humanitarian organization. Dr. Rainy Hart may have that. So these are the in initial uh, pictures from 2017, early 18. You can see that. Turkish uh, government provided some water, and then the sanitation and all those. These are the initial hour camp, which is called Health and Education for All. <coughs> this is the tent. You can see here, that's the laptop working as a server. These are the tabs. They're getting the data, because it's all paperless, the total system. And how we did that? Because there is no electricity or anything. This is 2017 November picture. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Jane Carter took this picture. You can see that. Okay. And then this is the boy, actually. I showed many pictures. This, it, it was in uh, 1st of November, I think. But he was still oozing water. Mm -hmm. Because someone shot him like 
face to face, and he became unconscious. Some other people carried him there. He was unconscious, and then you know, half of his ear was lost. And so, so that was like real for us at that point. And that's the solar panel actually. That solar panel charges in the battery. The battery charges the Wi-Fi router, and then laptop works as a uh, server. And that connects all the tabs. It's a very simple system. And you can take the picture of the patient. It generates automatic barcode. You give the health card. They take that, and you can get a scan. Whenever they come, two years, two months, you can get the re report immediately. Because how? Because every evening, they are actually synchronizing with the cloud. It's a HIPAA compliant, mm -hmm. like a FDA approved process. So it's a HIPAA compliant uh, process. So every evening, it will get connected, so you get all the data from there. They are Coming in, coming back with the health card, you can see this is a malnutrition measurement with upper arm. We also have fingerprinting, but we stopped that because there are some concern about that. But one from one doctor from Canada actually approached me that whether we can provide them some information for refugee and asylum, that kind of things, that would be helpful if we have that, that they can prove easily in the court. Because sometimes it's very difficult to prove that they're refugees, but they were in the camp. So this is the tab. Like you can see that station one, two, three, four. Whatever station they are sitting, they just tap it, and then it opens. It can calculate height, weight, and then it calculates BMI, then blood pressure. I'll not go through that. This is the doctor's tab. He can get the summary, everything there quickly. And then the flags will be there if the blood glucose is high or blood pressure is high. You can have that. This is more recent pictures of how inside the camp. It was tent, and then later we have some semi of structure donated by uh, PwC Foundation. So these are old pictures. Some pictures I'll just go through quickly, just to sh give you the idea like how it's. This is the 2018 flooding. Mm -hmm. You can see in front of us. 2006, almost 2,700 landslides happened in 2018. So it's a mobile population. It's like from one place to another, they're running around. So, and then this, our healthcare system, that paperless electronic system is helping us tremendously. Because so far we treated, I think 51,000 patients and 130,000 visits. So per month we are treating almost six to 7,000. In two camps, 250 to 300 people are being treated. So these are the quick data. I'll not go through the disease pattern and all those. This is, you can see the women, as we are saying that women are suffering more in the war and everything. But here you can also see that the diabetes, that, that orange or big red is female. So everything is, uh, the hypertension, diabetes, everything is more in female. So that's. There are findings that there are these <coughs> things are happening, but actually uh, here is very stark, and you can see the 20 to 40 years, they have the highest rate of this, and they all are getting like what we give them treatment every week. They come, we give them medicine, measure the pressure or blood glucose. This is malnutrition data, so I'll not go through this tuberculosis. We do with the BRAC, with their help, and there are like people going there for humanitarian work. The doctors, students from the U.S., Canada. Bangladesh, every place. So these are just a few pictures. Mm -hmm. So actually, so far what we did is 130,000 patient visits, 51,000. So so far actually it's 60,000. The data we analyzed when we were submitting the paper to Lancet. Uh, I think next week we are almost end up. It's, it's a showing that it's when we are talking about the acute problems, if you see the 4% of them, I didn't show the data, 4% of them are hypertensive or di diabetic. And if you are thinking of long-term rehabilitation or care, w what would you do? Because those patients will become with renal failure or in the long term they will have a blindness. Or there are many other diseases. So if you just think of the vaccine or cholera, or then we are averting that. But if we have that, so these people are like almost 16,000 people are hypertensive, 16,000 are diabetic. So and there are not insulin, there are not enough things. Like, because we can solve the problem maybe down the road, four years, five years, or 10 years, or 20 years. But at this point, we need some systematic uh, uh, healthcare system. So thank you all. Mm -hmm.